all right what is up y'all welcome back so let's watch this video it is titled hill turns that were 100 percent justified let's watch They say a bad guy or a villain in pro wrestling has to have their own personal justification for why they turn to the dark side. The best heels are the ones who feel like their actions are valid, they have rational reasoning for going rogue, and the reasons why they're now a bad guy was maybe because they were once treated in a poor or incorrect manner that they felt was unfair. I want to look at a few examples of this in today's video, heels in wrestling who were totally justified that. for turning bad in the first place. And just as a quick heads up, I'm not necessarily listing that the greatest heels of all years. time here, but rather I want to highlight some pro wrestling villains who had perfectly sound reasons for breaking bad. Rather than list off 10 or 15 examples here, I want to focus on a select few and talk in depth about what made these guys and girls turn heel. So this is going to go into a bit more detail than previous videos with only 5 names getting brought up. This one's fresh in my mind due to covering it on Reliving the War. Stephanie isn't what anyone would call a great, good or even average in-ring performer. That's really not what Stephanie brings to the table, even though she's been featured inside the ring as a competitor a total of 24 times. No, Stephanie McMahon was an authority figure on TV, but she was also able to garner a lot of heat no matter what era she performed in. Sure, she was also a babyface authority figure too, and she led the charge on SmackDown during a time when the blue brand was a fantastic show to watch, but to me, Stephanie was always better as a villain. When we first saw <laughs> Stephanie on WWF TV on a full time basis, she was simply Mr. McMahon's sweet little daughter. Her protective dad wanted to make sure no harm ever came to her, and honestly, she was rather bland. The Ministry of Darkness wanted to abduct Stephanie in an effort to get at Vince. They brought her to a boiler room, they put her on the Undertaker's symbol. The Phenom even attempted to marry Stephanie in an unholy wedding, but thanks to guys like Ken Shamrock and Steve Austin, Stephanie was always rescued just in the nick of time. Turns out that Vince McMahon was behind these abductions all along. When Vince announced he was the greater power, it was made clear that McMahon would use his own family just to get the upper hand in his feud against Stone Cold. Well, Stephanie didn't forget about all of this. She carried on with her life and she got engaged to big Andrew Martin, better known as Test. But on the night of the wedding, Triple H announced that he actually married Stephanie in Las Vegas after spiking her drink. Vince was heartbroken, he turned babyface around this time and he was in the middle of a feud against Triple H, so the fact that Hunter would do something so wow. low and something so, well, illegal made McMahon see right. red. Triple H and Vince had a match, the game beat McMahon in the middle of the ring, and it was revealed that Stephanie and Triple H had set this up all along and Stephanie was actually madly in love with Hunter Hearst Helmsley. <laughs> she revealed on Raw that she planned this heel turn this for a very long crazy. time. Stephanie didn't forget about her dad using her as a pawn during the whole Ministry of Darkness fiasco. Vince caused his daughter a great deal of anxiety, stress and fear when he had the Undertaker abduct her on more than one occasion. And so Stephanie was totally justified in screwing Vince over. The fans of the Attitude Era, of course, didn't see it this way. Stephanie had aligned herself with the WWF's top heel and the McMahon-Hemsley era was born. There was no way rational thought would play a factor here because Triple H was such an unlikable villain himself, plus Stephanie would begin abusing her power the moment Vince was taken out of the equation. Still, in my opinion, Stephanie was in the right, she got payback for being mistreated in the past, and Stephanie would find great success over the years in being a pro wrestling heel. Chris Jericho had flipped from babyface to heel quite a few times, but he was more than justified for turning heel in 2008. Fans were excited when Chris came back after a long break, the Save Us promos went down a trade and Jericho was kinda put under a microscope as he began having matches again. Though something just wasn't clicking. If you go back and watch these matches yourself, you'll see that Chris wasn't exactly fitting in all that well, but the moment he turned heel, he began one of the greatest runs of his career. Shawn Michaels played a huge part in this one, as did Dave Batista. Batista thought Shawn got a great deal of enjoyment from retiring Ric Flair at WrestleMania, and so, at Backlash 2008, Batista wanted to face HBK in a one-on-one -on -one match. 
Sean and Batista then went on to Chris Jericho's highlight reel and Jericho asked some pretty difficult questions here. He wanted to know if Sean really did enjoy retiring Flair, while also wondering if Batista wouldn't have done the same thing had he been in Sean's boots at Mania 24. Both HBK and Batista were put on the spot by Jericho, but Chris was just doing his job as a host while trying to get a better understanding of what both men were thinking. Batista had a surprise for Sean though, he already spoke with the Smackdown GM Vicky Guerrero, and Raw GM William Regal confirmed that a match between the two would definitely take place at Backlash. The following week, Sean returned to the highlight reel and Jericho poked the bear once again. He said Sean maybe did enjoy retiring Flair, saying that Sean kinda thrives on this kind of thing. He's been selfish before in regards to screwing over Bret Hart. HBK's a bit of an egomaniac and everyone knows this, so maybe Sean took some joy in putting Ric Flair out of wrestling for good. With this in mind, Jericho also said Batista was being a little irrational. No doubt Batista disliked Sean and this maybe goes beyond his relationship with Flair, but Dave's maybe going a bit too far with his assumptions. Sean won't say a word, he won't talk to Chris at all, and when Chris wonders if HBK was maybe the guy who suggested Flair's retirement to Vince McMahon in the first place, Ooh. why 2 j takes a super kick? <laughs> Jericho then goes to Regal, wanting to get put in the Batista vs. Michaels match at Backlash. Regal instead makes Jericho the Just special referee, game. and at the pay per view, Sean feigned a knee injury in order to get a win over Batista. The match was completely stopped when Michaels went down. Jericho kept Batista away from Sean while trying to work out what to do next. HBK then delivered sweet chin music out of nowhere, and Sean won via pinfall. Michaels didn't reveal that he faked the injury after the match, instead Jericho helped him out of the ring and back up through the entrance curtain. And then, the next night on Raw, Jericho wanted to present Sean with an award for his masterful acting. Jericho said, yeah. it's fine, Chris understands this game better than anyone and yeah. Sean should be happy that he fooled Batista at Backlash, but HBK was in no rush to accept this award. The pair would then team up on Raw, Sean still kept the act up which did make Chris think that Sean was maybe telling the truth. So the next week, on the 12th of May 2008, Chris apologised. He said he was sorry for not believing Sean. But then HBK admitted to feigning the injury, he faked it all along and he pulled the wool over Jericho's eyes. Sean said he was sorry for what he did but the whole thing was made up. Chris didn't believe Sean, he thought HBK was still working him, so to prove he was absolutely fine, HBK hit Jericho with another super kick before leaving the ring. Basically, <laughs> Sean had played Jericho for a fool and as you can see, Y2J would have been completely in the right to turn on Michaels for all the lies he told. As a matter of fact, Sean could have easily turned heel here but the fans loved him too much. Sean would beat Chris Jericho in a match at Judgment Day. The two shook hands after the bout. HBK then finished up some business with Dave Batista, and then, on the 9th of June episode of Raw, Jericho completed his heel turn. Once again on the highlight reel, Chris said Sean was a liar. He lied to Batista, he lied to Chris himself, and he lied to all these fans regarding his injury. Sean said he made it clear he'd do whatever he needed yeah, he to do to beat Batista, but Jericho face. won't let it go. He says Sean got cheered more than ever when he super kicked him a few weeks back. No matter what bad or evil thing Sean does, the fans will still love him. Jericho got booed for trying to do the right thing and for telling the truth, and Sean is nothing more than a lying, pathetic little worm of a human being. Jericho then attacked HBK, Michaels got thrown into the Jeritron 5000, and the feud of the year was then truly underway. Jericho was right in everything he said, Sean did lie through his teeth, the fans did favour a liar like Michaels over Chris Jericho while Chris was only trying to expose Sean for what he really was, and so Y2J was totally justified in turning to the dark side seeing as the fans just flat out refused to boo Sean Michaels. A fantastic heel turn here though, a great slow burner that rewarded viewers for paying attention. Chris Jericho may have turned heel thanks to the actions of one Shawn Michaels, but HBK also found himself in a predicament that led to a heel turn back in 1997, a predicament that really wasn't his fault. In the run up to SummerSlam 97, a WWF Championship match was booked between challenger Bret Hart and champion The Undertaker, and this match had some heavy implications should Bret fail to win. 
The hitman said he would never wrestle on American soil again if he couldn't beat The Undertaker at SummerSlam. And it should be noted that this actually wasn't out of the realm of possibility, even though it sounded ludicrous. You see, particularly in 1997, the WWF went to Canada quite frequently for Raw shows over the course of the year. The upcoming Survivor Series 97 show was also going to be held in Montreal, and it's not like the match provision couldn't have been changed as time went on, allowing Bret to once again wrestle in America after a face turn or after some other shenanigans played out on WWF TV. Bret could have also cut promos in America while not actually wrestling in the country for a little while. So what I'm saying is, this wasn't like a WCW match stipulation where the stipulation itself gave away the outcome. If Bret wasn't allowed to wrestle in America while still being employed by the WWF, then I feel there were some good stories and angles that could have happened post SummerSlam 97. Anyway, during this time, Brett was in the middle of his excellent Heart Foundation storyline where he had frequently say he wasn't so much anti-American as he was pro-Canadian. And when Rob had to visit the Halifax, Nova Scotia on the 21st of July 1997, Shawn Michaels announced that he was going to serve as the special referee for the Bret Hart vs Undertaker match. Seeing as this announcement was made in Canada, HBK made sure to ham it up in an attempt to get the crowd all fired up. You have to remember too that Brett was a hero practically everywhere else in the world but America, and this meant, generally speaking, Sean was seen as the bad guy when the WWF took their shows across the border, but this is par for the course really. At his core, Sean was still a babyface in America and therefore he was mainly presented as a babyface on TV. HBK also announced that he had some rules he had to abide by at SummerSlam. If Sean didn't call the match right down the middle, then he also wouldn't be allowed to wrestle on American soil ever again. Mm. Sean had to be fair and he wasn't allowed to favour The Undertaker in any way, shape or form, or his time in the ring would be severely cut down following the pay-per-view. These stipulations caused a lot of intrigue heading into SummerSlam and I've always maintained <laughs> that the did. WWF couldn't have written a better finish for Bret vs Taker. That to this crazy. day, it's still my favourite match finish of all time. HBK noticed a chair in the ring, a chair that Bret used on The Undertaker, and Sean rightfully confronted Bret about the chair he referee as promised. So he confronted Bret again wanting to know why the chair was in the ring. Brett looked at Sean, he said fuck you before spitting in Sean's face, and so HBK did what anyone would do in this type of situation, he swung the chair. The only problem was Brett ducked out of the way and Sean ended up hitting Taker right on the head, and when Brett covered the champion, Sean had no oh, choice but to kind of loogie. If oh. HBK wanted to keep his career in America, he had to award the WWF Championship Dang, to his arch nemesis Brett Hart. It. The key here he is that a grown it. man cursed Sean out while spitting in his face in public. Imagine it's all real and this happened to you. I mean, <laughs> what would you do? The next night on Raw, Sean realised that the fans were blaming him for The Undertaker losing the championship. And while there definitely was an element of truth to that fact, Sean focused on how Vince McMahon and the WWF put him in a lose-lose situation. Whereas Vince McMahon <laughs> and the WWF refused to take responsibility for booking the stipulations, booking the match and putting HBK inside the ring as a referee in the first place. Vince McMahon, the WWF and the fans should have known that something like this was going to happen and now I mean, that it has happened, the fans are turning on Sean because he stood up for himself. It's so important to remember that Sean tried to put all personal issues aside at SummerSlam and he wanted to be a fair referee. HBK was always an advocate for fans cheering and booing for whoever they wanted. It was one of the driving factors oh, in his feud against one. Bret Hart that he had repeated quite a few times in late 96 and early 97. So Sean embraced the bad reaction he was getting while telling everyone that he doesn't care what they think of him. He was put in a bad spot, he still called the match right down the middle. He had someone curse him out and spit in his face live on TV. And if Sean was going down for this one, he was going to take everyone with him while going out in a blaze of glory. It all boils down to being treated incredibly no. poorly by one of your peers in the ring I and then getting booed for you. doing what you thought was right and standing up for yourself. The Undertaker was the victim in all this, which was unfair, I do admit, but ask yourself this, wouldn't The Undertaker have done the exact same thing as Sean? 
The chair shot changed everything though as it led to D-Generation X, the first Hell in a Cell match, the controversial Montreal Brett vs Sean bout and all the things that followed from that very Survivor Series match. So it's also an important heel turn when we talk about the entire history of the WWF and pro wrestling. Mm -mm -mm. Also, I could have included Bret Hart's 1997 heel turn in this video. His reasoning for turning his back on the American fans was sound and it made for a compelling pro wrestling villain. But I've talked about that particular turn one too many times and so I've left it out of this particular video. <laughs> no, that was very justifiable. I would have been pissed too. Especially if you're just trying the to make a job, so you can be able to do, you know, shows. The mega pause breaking up may have caused a lot of heartache for young WWF fans across the globe, but let me tell you, you something, brother. Like, Randy you know, Savage was totally in the right, and the evidence was right there for everyone to see. Hogan and Macho teaming up was more than a dream team. Two of the biggest pro wrestling babyfaces coming together to rid the WWF of all evildoers was the stuff dreams were made of, especially for younger fans. But throw a beautiful lady into the mix and a guy who might be just a little paranoid at times and you've got a recipe for disaster. Now, for sure, Savage was a little paranoid when it came to Miss Elizabeth and he had a tendency to be a bit overprotective. But Hulk Hogan gave Savage every right to be paranoid. As a matter of fact, a lesser man would have attacked Hogan much sooner. Hogan and Savage's relationship began all the way back on the October 3rd, 1987 edition of Saturday Night's Main Event. Miss Elizabeth ran to Hulk Hogan when Savage was in a bit of trouble and the Hulkster helped Macho out. Throughout the oh, months no. that followed, the two would have each other's backs, with Hulk That's even being there when Macho good. won the WWF Championship at Mania 4. But the two wouldn't have their televised debut match as a tag team until SummerSlam 88. Here, the boys took on the Mega Bucks, Ted DiBiase and Andre the Giant. And after the Mega Powers won the match, Randy noticed Hogan getting a bit too close to Elizabeth. A bit too touchy-feely for Macho's liking. Still, it was played off subtly. The commentators made no it kind of gives like they were already messing around because y'all are like too comfortable. Like y'all are too comfortable being all close. So it's kind of like a natural reaction because y'all already been fucking. <laughs> no mention of what was going on because in their eyes, Hogan could do no wrong. The Hulkster really was just a friend, but maybe Macho wasn't seeing it that way. The next month at Survivor Series, uh -uh. the same thing happened again. And seeing as this was the second time it happened, Savage began getting really paranoid. Hulk Hogan was getting way too friendly with Miss Elizabeth and it didn't help that Hogan had started asking Liz to be his valet for singles matches. The Hulkster put Liz in wait, danger he did, by- Wait, what? He did what? Hulk Hogan was getting way too friendly with Miss Elizabeth and it didn't help that Hogan had started asking Liz to be his valet for singles matches. The Hulkster put Liz yeah, in danger it. by doing this, and Savage, rightfully Already. so, showed more concern for Elizabeth than what he did for Hulk Hogan. Hogan messed up, he couldn't keep Savage's valet safe, and as far as Randy saw it, that no good Hulk Hogan had lust in his eyes for Miss Elizabeth. This wasn't the only problem, yeah. however. The Hulkster accidentally eliminated Savage from the 1989 Royal Rumble. So you tell me, brother, what would you do in this type of situation? The way Randy saw things, it was impossible to put all these incidents down as nothing more than coincidental. And remember, the Macho Man was the WWF Champion. What better way to get into the Champion's head than to mess with his woman, cost him matches, and then act like the champ's the one who isn't thinking straight? Think about this, and I know it would never have happened, but That'd indulge me right. for a moment. If Hogan actually turned heel at the culmination of the Megapar storyline, it would have made perfect sense. Like imagine if Hogan cut a promo after beating Savage at Mania where he fully admitted to playing Macho and Liz all along just so he could win the WWF Championship. It would have been something we'd still talk about today for sure, but I'm getting off track. The Megapars broke up on the second main event show on NBC. Liz got knocked out, Hogan carried her away from the ring to get medical attention while leaving Macho all on his own to fight Akeem and the big boss man. Liz told Hulk to go back to the ring and help out Macho. He returned to his corner only for Randy to smack him across the face because he totally deserved it. And Macho left the ring to let Hogan deal with Akeem and boss man all on his own. Hogan still won the match, of course, and when uh, Hulk went backstage, he was confronted by Macho. Savage said Hogan was trying to steal Liz away from him. Hogan said he wasn't. But Randy was tired of being the third wheel in this whole Megapars deal, and he was tired of dealing with one coincidence after another. And so he attacked Hulk while Liz screamed her head off. 
The two would then move forward with the build-up towards Mania 5. Savage would show some exaggerated footage of how Hogan lusted after Elizabeth while Hogan showed proof that there was nothing going on. Liz was stuck in between both men and no one knew who she was going to support at Mania, but in the end she'd be in a neutral corner. During the match she got way too involved when trying to help both men out so she was sent to the backstage area while Savage and Hogan continued their match. And in the end, Hogan reigned supreme by capturing the WWF Championship from Macho Man Randy Savage. Bit of an odd choice here, but we don't talk enough about Big Daddy Cool's that turn was in weird. 1995. It wasn't a full-blown heel turn really either, weird. but he definitely wasn't the white meat babyface anymore. And it was all because Diesel was tired of being told what to do by Vince McMahon and the folks at Titan Towers. Diesel won the WWF Championship at the end of 1994 and McMahon pushed Big Daddy Cool to the moon. Vince was still looking for his big guy babyface champion ever since Hulk Hogan had left and ever since Lex Luger had shit the bed when he was given the opportunity. McMahon saw a lot of promise in Kevin Nash due to his look, his size and the way he carried himself. And so the rocket was strapped to Diesel's bag and Big Daddy Cool stayed champion for much of 1995. Business went down big time during this year and I must stress that the burden shouldn't fall on Kevin Nash alone. It didn't matter who was champion during this time period because wrestling just wasn't as hot as it was once before. Even HBK holding the title the following year didn't bring the WWF back to the promised land. And really the whole new generation era needed to get phased out before the WWF would get back to better business but anyway. Diesel became a totally different person while holding the WWF title. Throughout 1993 and 1994, Big Daddy Cool was a big old badass who only cared about protecting himself and his kayfabe employer, Shawn Michaels. But when he won the WWF title, he had to become what he thought was a stereotypical WWF champion. He had to do appearances, he had to shake hands, he had to kiss babies, he had to fight the good fight with a big old smile on his face, and really, this wasn't who Diesel was. It's Survivor Series 95, Diesel lost the WWF title to Bret Hart and the big man snapped. He dropped bread with multiple jackknife power bombs after the match and the fans, commentators and officials in the ring wondered just what on earth had gotten into Big Daddy Cool. The next night on Raw, Nash explained everything. He said Vince McMahon and the WWF tried to turn him into something that just wasn't him. They tried to turn him into a politically correct corporate stooge while stripping away his personality. In order to be the face of the WWF during the new generation era, Diesel had to present himself in a way that didn't align with his own beliefs and in turn, this made his time as WWF Champion a living hell. Mm. So ask yourself, if your boss asked you to change who you are for the sake of better job prospects, would you be keen for a promotion? If your individuality was taken away while you're being told to act That's like those who came before experience. you just to appease people around you, would you do it? Diesel said he slept like a baby after Survivor Series. He saw a smile on his face for the first time in a year when he looked in the mirror. He's no longer a corporate puppet created by Vince McMahon and from that point on Diesel would only care about fans who wore his black glove. Diesel was still down with I those who matters. truly supported him. The rest, well, he didn't really care about the rest. From here, Diesel would work as a tweener. He wrestled babyfaces and heels up until WrestleMania 12. Going up against The Undertaker made Kevin a full-blown heel, but at this point, he had already given in his notice and his main role was to put guys over Whoa. on his way out the door. His final match against Shawn Michaels was superb and he had then leave to change wrestling forever as part of the New World Order. Yeah, that would be fucking miserable, not being able to be yourself. Well, you that's five turns in pro wrestling where I feel the guys and girls were totally in the right for turning their no. backs on the fans. I know you'll have way more examples to share, and as always, I'd like you guys to share your thoughts your in the comments section. Your character just isn't as great I either. I think this topic deserves a bit more detail, so fans who didn't it's see the heel turn yourself. as it happened can gain a better understanding of the whole story. And when I do a follow-up to this video, I'll want to pick out another five and talk about them in depth. So you know what to do, fill up the comment section and I'll have a look when the video goes live. Thank you so much for watching and please <laughs> This <care>. is crazy. <laughs> no, these are all justified, especially, no, this one though, this between Macho Man and um, Hulk Hogan, buddy as hell. I would have enjoyed that storyline um, back in the day, just witnessing all that is going down and him like being all, well, they were all over each other, so.
that was very strange but it's gonna do it for this reaction you guys make sure you leave some likes and comments down below let me know what you guys think and i will see you in the next one